Now, in the event of a blackout, you need to bear that in mind if you're going to run a sump system. See so here, these are the pieces that go on. So those plug straight in. Tosa, what are you doing? Stop. <laughs> Do not kick it this way. And here's what the sump looks like at the moment. I'm part way through cleaning uh, the mechanical filtration side. So what happens when the sump is, uh, requires cleaning is water bypasses this bubble trap. It doesn't flow down underneath all the sponges and then up through the bubble trap and then into the uh, biological filtration side. What it does when it's clogged, it just bypasses this bit of glass here, this bubble trap, and just straight flows into the biological filtration side. Now, that, when that happens, obviously it indicates to me that this uh, sponge media is full of debris and I need to clean it out. Now, I don't always clean it out all the way, and in fact, I'm still not gonna do that today. What I'm gonna do now, I've cleaned out um, most of it, half of it. I'm gonna clean out this last layer as well, and I'll lift that out and try and keep all the debris on top of this sponge. Now, if I don't clean it, what will happen is the biological filtration will uh, start to clog up and that's a lot harder to clean out because it's all individual rock it's all rock in here uh, it's about 20 kilos of um, volcanic lava rock as well as pumice uh, stone and aquaponic beads so there's a lot of different stone in here for the biological filtration uh, and you can see I've also got some double-headed sponge filters just some sponges in there just to keep them seated if I do need to start up a tank uh, straight away biological media ready to go and a cycle won't start so having some filter media on hand in your sun is really handy just in case you need to set up a tank for any reason so basically what I do when I want to clean my sump is I turn off all the pumps so I've got three return pumps in here and you can see these are the um, microcontrollers for each of those pumps and I turn them off from the mains which is just here so turn them off let all the water drain out because uh, there's a lot of plumbing in this fish room as you can see and all that plumbing has to drain out to the sump now in the event of a blackout, this is the water level my sump will drain to. So you need to bear that in mind if you're going to run a sump system because when all the power turns off, all the water is going to drain out of that plumbing and from the aquarium. So normally when the aquarium is in operation, most of the tanks are filled, filled up to this line here, the top of my nail. And you can see they've dropped a little bit. Now all that combined water is a lot of litres of water that drains back to the sump. So you need to be, bear that in mind when you're designing a sump system that your sump is high enough to accommodate all that volume of water rushing back to your sump uh, in the event of a blackout so you don't overflow your sump. If you were to over, overflow your sump, obviously you're gonna have a lot of water on the floor. Also, when the power returns, your sump might run dry because there's not enough water in the system to keep circulating through all the aquariums in your fish room. So you're just gonna keep that in mind. Anyway, so what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna try and take this sponge out of here as, as carefully as I can without disturbing all the debris too much and pop it in here. One of the main things you need for this, for this job is uh, some good gloves. You don't want to be handling this stuff. So get some good washing gloves, uh, powder free. So anyway, here's some sponges I've cleaned already. You see there's a, quite a few here and the filter socks as well. Anyway, let's get to it. Now we're outside in my backyard. You can see this filter media isn't too dirty. I mean, there is obviously a lot of sludge on the top, uh, but I should have showed you the other ones that were covered in this stuff, the whole layer of it. This is gonna be a little bit hard to film because obviously I don't wanna splash the camera. There's the filter mat, and here's the hose. So now I'm gonna really try hard not to splash the camera. So basically, I just use my garden hose. So in a methodical manner, Washing, hosing it off. So obviously that's one surface clean. Other side isn't as bad. I'll just pan across for a second, I wanna show you something. This guy going nuts in my garden bed, which isn't much of a garden bed at the moment. <laughs> Taser, what are you doing? Stop. <laughs> Do not kick it this way. Jeez. <laughs> All right, let's continue on with this. Uh, isn't that, is that in the frame? Yes it is. So it's probably hard for you guys to pick up uh, in the footage here how dirty these are. Because this side isn't too bad. So I clean both sides of the sponges and then I also go around the edges and clean them. After cleaning all the edges, I wring them out and I repeat the process. And you'll see the amount of debris this loosens up. Try not to get it all over yourself. And this is the process for why you really need your gloves. I mean, the smell isn't bad. Like right now, I can't smell anything, but when you smell your hands later, it's bloody horrible. 
Also helps if your hose has a locking mechanism so you don't get hand strain. And because these aren't too dirty, I won't have to do this, uh, I won't have to repeat the process many times. And the last one I had to do this about five times on all edges because the filter matting was that bad. The deeper you go into the sump, the cleaner the sponges are. So the top layers are a little bit uh, obviously dirtier than uh, the bottom layers because they are trapping most of the debris. This is what I used to do and really ties your arm out once all the water's in uh, the filter mat and you're doing this for about 40 minutes. But this really does help clean the filter matting a lot easier rather than just leaving it on the ground. And you can monitor the water flowing out the bottom of the filter mat and see how clear it's becoming with each uh, pass you make over the filter matting. And this is where you can really get splashed if you get the angle wrong. <laughs> but uh, doing this about once every six weeks and it is a lot easier than using the aquarium water to clean the sponges and a lot more thorough. I used to use the aquarium water, but it never really cleaned them as well as I wanted to. And I'd have to keep re-cleaning the sump more often because I could never really get these sponges as clean as they really required. And we can see the bottom here, the water is starting to get a little bit clearer. There is obviously some brown tinge to it. It's not spotless, but it doesn't have to be. Just wring it out and try not to get it all over yourself. The fun part, not. So this isn't really, yeah, obviously one of the fun parts of fish keeping. You really want to consider, for a while, if this is for you, um, because you have to do this regularly if you really want to keep your fish nice and healthy. Now, one of the questions people probably ask is, well, you're using chlorinated water to clean your sponges. Is that bad for the fish? Well, if you do this quick enough, it actually doesn't really affect them. And I'm, again, I'm not relying on this uh, filter media as biological filtration. I'm relying on this for mechanical filtration to keep the water clear. Now, uh, as you saw in the, the sump, there's all that lava rock, all that pumice stone, uh, the aquaponic beads, that's what I use for my biological filtration. That's where all the beneficial bacteria hopefully is. Um, and this really shouldn't shake up the system too much because I'm relying on that second chamber for all the biological filtration. This is the mechanical filtration just to take those particulates out of the water. Anyway, this is the last bit of sponge I'll be cleaning today. And obviously it's a small piece, so it shouldn't take too long. The smaller pieces are obviously easier to clean because they're lighter when they're full of water. I could cut up all the sponges so they weren't this big but uh, take a little bit longer to do all those little individual sponges. So I just put up with the, the weight of those sponges when they're full of water. I clean the filter socks the same way. Just put them on the ground, hose them out, wring them out, do it again. Rinse and repeat, literally, until uh, everything's white for those filter socks. The filter socks do help uh, slow down the amount of debris that go into uh, the sponges. And if you were to stay on top of it, uh, you can just keep cleaning out those filter socks uh, and once they start overflowing that's just trying to clean them out because the water isn't going through the filter sock and into the media into the sponge media it's actually overflowing at the top of the sock so those filter socks get clogged as well and uh, if you keep that up you won't have to do this as often either those filter socks get full water's flowing out of them and it's effectively creating the same conditions that these sponges were creating with the whole sump uh, and flowing straight into the biological filtration side and that's all there is to it so that's pretty clean. Now use your judgment for when you want to call it and basically say, okay, I'm done with this. I've got a couple other things to do today, so uh, I'm gonna call it now. But as you can see, the next layer of filter media here has now got uh, some deposits on it, but I'm gonna leave it at that. Now, obviously you can clean that out, siphon it out with the hose, and uh, it will be even cleaner. So what I'm gonna do now is start putting the filter media back in. Now you don't wanna push the filter media down too hard uh, because even just doing that will restrict the flow going through the mechanical filtration side of your sump. One of the things you want to do when you're designing your sump system is uh, with the plumbing and the drain lines especially when they're going into this compartment is you want to have access to get the sponges out and put them back in and if you glue all the plumbing to these drain lines 
you might not have access to or have the filter media. So always be mindful of that when you're designing your plumbing. You can see here, these are the pieces that go on. So those plug straight in. So this one goes like this on this drain line. So this drain line here is coming from the middle row of aquariums. Six aquariums are coming, the water is coming out uh, from this drain line, from six aquariums to this drain line and then this, into this chamber. Now, you see a little uh, the elbow on there, and that's just to soften the water flow as the, as the water comes in to the sump area. Uh, if I just had it dropping in, it would be really loud. So having the elbows on there kind of soften the water from uh, splashing around too much. Obviously, you're going to hear the noise. Uh, you're going to hear some splashing, but uh, that try, that, I'm trying to minimize it as much as possible. Now what I'm going to do is put the filter socks over these. Tie them up like you're tying a shoelace. And again, in a few weeks' time, these filter socks will overflow. Once they get clogged up with debris, they will overflow and uh, water won't flow through the sock as efficiently as it should and it'll come out the top here and then spill into this chamber which will clog up this chamber even quicker then and then that's when water will flow over the top of this bubble trap into the, into the biological filtration side and you don't want that. So uh, I've tried to minimise the amount of places uh, debris can clog up for the next few weeks and uh, what we'll do now is we'll turn on the microcontrollers and we'll see how well we've cleaned uh, this filter compartment. If water starts to flow over this bubble trap, we haven't done a good enough job, uh, but I can guarantee you that is not going to happen now. So here's the microcontrollers for the three uh, return pumps that I got in the system. So this microcontroller here, the return pump for it, filters the two four foot aquariums as well as six two by two foot aquariums on the middle row. So the bottom row and the middle row are filtered by this one return pump. This return pump pumps water to the very top row of aquariums, feeding 12 two foot by one foot aquariums. And this one here, this microcontroller, you can see it's a little bit smaller, is only filtering two aquariums, but they're five foot long each. Anyway, let's turn them back on. And you'll see them slowly ramp up their wattage. And you'll hear the water flowing. So water's already flowing to the five foot aquarium. Now, what you should see on the camera here is this water level here getting lower and lower and lower. So what we might do is focus in on that a little bit so you can see what I'm talking about. We'll drop the exposure a little bit because I really want you to see, pay close attention to this compartment here. So the water level will drop on these two compartments more than this one. So this water level will only drop to the height of this bit of glass here. And water in this compartment will only ever drop to the, le to the level that this bit of glass is at. It should just trickle in to this sump area where the return pumps and the heaters are. And it shouldn't get much lower than around this area, this region here, and that is fine. Uh, you don't want to obviously, again, you don't want to fill up your, your sump too much because if you fill it up too much and the power cuts out, it will overflow. Uh, and vice versa, you don't want to, you want to fill it enough so the return pumps are submerged in water. Now let's see uh, where this water level will uh, uh, settle at. So right now the water level is pretty much level with this glass and that's amazingly clean, that means it's amazingly clean, but the water flow hasn't hit its highest peak yet. All the drain lines are still filling up with water uh, because I've just turned the sun back on. So it'll take a little bit of time, a couple of minutes, for this water level in this chamber to settle at its uh, height. And that just all depends on how well I've cleaned those sponges. But we've got that much buffering with the amount of glass that's in this uh, divider. Obviously, in hindsight, I should have got the tank builder to, say, build the bubble trap all the way up to here, this bit of glass, and then I'll have even more weeks uh, in between cleaning the sump. But obviously, the longer you leave cleaning the sump, the fish might suffer. So what happens is, water's obviously getting pumped out of this whole sump. You can see the water level now is lower here. When we had, when we turned on the sump, the water level was up here. It's currently at this point now. So all the water is going back into the aquariums. Now the aquariums have to fill up to a certain level until the water trickles over a bulkhead at the back of each aquarium. So it needs to get to a certain height. Now once it gets to that certain height, it will level off. It will reach a level of equilibrium. And once it reaches that level of equilibrium, we will know how well we've cleaned all these sponges. And right now the water level is looking really good. Uh, but again, the aquariums still have a little bit of uh, filling to go 
until um, everything in here is settled. So it looks like we've done a pretty good job cleaning this compartment because the tanks are pretty much at their max level. I've cleaned the sponges really well because you can see this water level hasn't risen at all that much. It's only risen above this bit of uh, glass. So optimally, the water level in this chamber should be this height. Okay, because of this glass here, this piece of glass here is at this height. So optimally, the, the water level will be this high. It's actually an inch deeper, but that is because you see there are some debris still in the bottom layers of sponge filter, and the sponge itself is slowing down the water rate. And you can see how clean the biological filtration site is. Water is able to flow through all that rock out into this uh, bubble trap area because it's pretty much the same level all the way through to this height of this glass. You can see here, we have got a little sticker here that says fill. When I'm doing my water changes, I generally don't uh, put more water than this fill line. Because that, if I put more water, much more water than uh, this, the height of this fill line, in the event of a blackout, this sump might overflow. So the next thing to do is to put the lid on. So this is just some core flute. I'll zoom out so you can see it a bit better. So this is just core flute, uh, used for roofing. Try not to get tangled up in the microphone cord. Spin around. Okay, you can see it's got some cutouts, and that's for the plumbing. So what I do now, I just slide this into the plumbing. Slide this over the plumbing, and sit it there. And that stops a lot of evaporation. If I didn't have that there, water would evaporate from the system a lot easier. Uh, on a sump system, you don't notice evaporation in the aquariums, you only notice it in the sump. The other thing I've got, is a black piece of uh, kind of core flute material. And that's purely to stop the light that's underneath this sump from creating algae growth in the sump. Because then you've got another problem, and you're more cleaning to do. And I sit on top of the clear core flute. And you can obviously get black core flute, uh, but I've just gotten that one. That just prevents algae growing in the sump. And the reason why I've got a light on the sump is this is the light that turns on first in the fish room every day and it's the last light to turn on just to get that day-night cycle uh, for the fish and not shock them when you know there's a dark fish room and then all the lights turn on that will really shock them if one little light's turning on in the in a corner that's slowly waking the fish up and uh, that light turns on and off automatically anyway guys there it is the sump is clean and I don't have to worry about that for the next few weeks